Good morning. Good morning. If you are new here among us, my function here at C3 Church is lead pastor. My title is Gene. If you've been here for a while, you know what I'm getting at. So this is one for you husbands and wives, you married couples out there. Have you ever had a disagreement with your spouse. If we're being honest, maybe an argument. Where you thought that you were completely right, that the facts were indeed on your side. You had all the facts until you're listening, maybe, to your spouse's arguments. Slowly but surely, you realize that you're not right. Maybe even wrong, if we can go that far. But instead of saying, I'm sorry, I was wrong, have you ever doubled down? <laughs> Do we double down when we know we're wrong? I've always said about marriage, you can be right or you can be happy. That's your choice. <laughs> ah, the year was 1993-ish when I saw the ultimate fighting championship for the first time. I was amazed as I watched a slender Hoyce Gracie defeat all of his opponents from other martial arts styles. He was a Brazilian jiu-jitsu practitioner, and he fought all kinds of different styles of martial arts, karate guys, kung fu guys, everything, some of whom were much, much bigger than him, but he dispensed of them in less than two minutes each. Unbelievable. This is because in Brazil, they had been refining the art of jiu-jitsu for 80-ish or so years through no-holds-barred competitions. While we, in America, had resigned ourselves to commercialism, black belt clubs, breaking boards, making people feel good about themselves, instead of actually getting on the mat and fighting, what it's all supposed to be about. We'd resigned ourselves to Hollywood myths about martial arts, instead of actually really doing it. The Brazilians noticed this. So they cleverly invented the ultimate fighting championship to prove that their martial art was the best. And it worked. At the time, I was a black belt here in America in a more traditional style of martial arts. So I figured, I'm going to go test my skills out against these Brazilians and this jiu-jitsu thing they're doing. It was hard to find a school at the time. There weren't many around because it was a brand new thing. So I had to drive real far. I found one. And I went in there and I noticed something unusual. There were no black belts there. 
Okay, so the only belt I saw with any color on it was a blue belt. So I approached him and I said, where's the sensei, using titles? And he said, well, uh, don't call me sensei, but I'm the teacher here. You got the wrong color belt on, friend. <laughs> well, he explained to me there are five belts, if you count white, white, blue, purple, brown, and black. So you're like the first belt and you're teaching people? How can you do that? Well, he explained to me, sometimes just to get to this first belt, it can take several years, a really long time. Okay. And by the way, black belt, just forget about that idea. Most people just don't get it because we don't give them out to kids. You have to be an adult. Plus, you have to be able to beat good black belts to get it. And that's really hard to do. Whatever. I was a little insulted when he put me with a white belt. I thought, well, come on, man, I'm a black belt. Let's go. You see, they lacked the formalities of traditional martial arts. There wasn't any bowing, no titles, no nothing like that. It was just all about fighting. So I was like, all right, let's go. Really informal. I figure, you know what, I'm just going to plow through this white belt and then get to the instructor. So I slapped hands with the guy, real informal, fist bump, and here we go. If I'm being honest, it took all of about 20 seconds before I was tapping out, before he was choking me out. Well, I fixed my black belt, which I was wearing, <laughs> and said, I wasn't ready. <laughs> all right, good attitude. Let's go again. If I'm being honest, it was all about another 20 seconds before I was tapping out again. And this cycle kept repeating itself over and over and over again. All the while, this white belt assuring me I can do whatever I want, no holds barred. Do whatever you bite, eye gouge, no excuses. He was taking all the excuses away. Oh yeah, you did that back then. Now it's kind of a sport. Back then it was not. Watch the original ones. <laughs> Brutal. Bite, eye gouge, whatever. It will not change the results. And it did not change the result. <laughs> I went home kind of bruised and battered, discouraged. And there was another problem. At the time, I was running a martial arts school. So I had to deal with this. What do I do? Well, at first, I thought, well, let's implement some of their techniques. And that kind of didn't work because there's a system to everything. You have to apply uh, to the system, basically. Easy way of putting it. So it didn't really work. Plus, people were getting confused. They would come in and they were like, are you a black belt in Brazilian jiu-jitsu? What are you doing here? So it wasn't honest. So I had a choice. I could double down. Insist that I was right, even though I knew I was wrong, or I could take the black belt off. Eventually, I did. I had to start from the beginning. And today, we are going to start from the beginning of our Bibles where we'll be taking a look at what we, too, might not have known about the rest of the story. Now, quick note for everyone. If you didn't see last week's message, if you're new, or you had something else to do, whatever, go back and watch it. I would also recommend watching Bible study. There's a lot in there. We covered a lot in Bible study. I had a sore throat from it. <laughs> There's a lot of talking. But it is a lot of information. It's a lot to cover. There's a lot which a lot of Christians don't understand about the Bible and how it works. So it'll make the rest of the series a lot easier to understand. But today, we're going to talk about Genesis 1 through 3. We're going to cover the story most people know. Then we're going to take a look at the rest of the story. Regarding Genesis 1, here's what most people know. God created everything, right? The heavens, the earth. Then he creates things in a series of days, right? The sky, the sea, 
the plants, the birds, the fish, the animals, and then man. That is Genesis 1. Maybe you know he rests when we get to 2, but let's not get ahead of ourselves. Now, here's something interesting. Many Christians think that the Holy Spirit arrived on Pentecost in the New Testament. But what if I told you that he's in the second verse of the Bible? Genesis 1.1, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was formless and empty, or void, and darkness covered the deep waters. And the Spirit of God was hovering over the surface of the waters. You might not know that the Trinity appears in the very first chapter of the Bible. You can see God the Father and God the Spirit here in the first two lines of Genesis. Then when we look at the full counsel of God's Word, we see the Son from the beginning. Genesis 1-3, then God said, let there be light. And there was light before the Son, S-U-N. We have to use the New Testament as a commentary on the Old Testament. It helps interpret it for us. So in John, it tells us what happened in the beginning. In the beginning, the Word, that is Jesus, already existed. The Word was with God, and the Word was God. He existed in the beginning with God. God created everything through him, and nothing was created except through him. The word gave life to everything that was created, and his life brought light to everyone. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness can never extinguish it. In the Genesis narrative, God refers to himself in the plural as us. Genesis 1, 26, then God said, let us make human beings in our image to be like us. On Genesis 1, we arrive at the very first divisive issue in the Christian community. The Genesis 1 account describes God creating everything in a series of days. Light and dark, day one. Sea and sky, day two. Plants, fertile earth, day three. Sun and moon, day four. Fish and birds, day five. Then animals, day six. Finally, us, mankind, or man. Here we arrive at a subject that perhaps many Christians are stuck on, which may be hindering them from getting the point of the story. They will divide over whether it is literal or not. Here's what Haley's Bible Handbook says. Whether the seven days were days of 24 hours or long successive periods, we do not know. The word day has variable meanings. In 1.5, it is used as a term for light. In 1.8 and 1.13, it seems to mean a day of 24 hours. In 1.14 and 1.16, are you guys checking this stuff? It seems to refer to a 12-hour day. In 2.4, it seems to cover the whole period of creation. In passages such as Joel 3.18, Acts 2.20, and John 16.23, that day seems to mean the whole Christian era. In passages such as 2 Timothy 1.12, the expression seems to refer to an era beyond the Lord's second coming. And in Psalm 94 and 2 Peter 3.8, with the Lord, a day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years is like one day. We do this in English, too. I say, back in the day, or we say today, meaning this day, same thing. Now, each viewpoint has its points, its merits, fine. But it's not good to argue or fight over it. This is not gospel. And we must remain open-minded about that which cannot really be understood. So here's what should be obvious and why 
Those who think these are literal days should remain open-minded. Genesis 1 is the story most Christians know. Genesis 2 gives us the rest of the story, or the other story, if we're reading very carefully. It gives us a different order of creation. In chapter 1, as I told you, man is created last on the sixth day. In chapter 2, man is created first-ish. Genesis 2, 4. This is the account of cre the creation of the heavens and the earth, when the Lord God made the earth and the heavens. Neither wild plants nor grains were growing on the earth, for the Lord God had not yet sent rain to water the earth, and there were no people to cultivate the soil. Instead, springs came up from the ground and watered all the land. Then the Lord God formed the man from the dust of the ground. He breathed breath into, of life into the man's nostrils, and the man became a living person. It specifically says, there were no wild plants yet, and man was created before them, which is different than the first account. So when we see things that are different from one another, we have to explore other options. It is important to be open-minded and kind to others who hold different beliefs about this, because this is not a science book. It doesn't give us all the measurements for the Earth, like it does for other things, like the Ark or the Tabernacle, for example. The exact procedure about those things can be known, but creation cannot. In a few weeks, we're going to go over Job. We're going to take a look at that, and I'll explain to you why that happens a little earlier on than some of you who know the Bible might think. But here's the deal. If you know about Job, right? He goes through a lot of bad stuff, and then his friends show up, and they begin kind of like having basically like a courtroom scene about why this is happening to Job. Basically, they're trying to figure God out. That's what they're doing. So God finally <laughs> shows up and says this, Job 38.1, Then the Lord answered Job from the whirlwind, who is this that questions my wisdom with such ignorant words? Brace yourself like a man, because I have some questions for you, and you must answer them. Where were you when I laid the foundations of the earth? Tell me, if you know so much. Who determined its dimensions and stretched out the surveying line? What supports its foundations, and who laid its cornerstone as the morning stars sang together, and all the angels shouted for joy? Hmm. We shouldn't miss the point. The point is that God is all present, all powerful, that he is with us. He created everything. He is God, and we are not. That's the point that we learn when we keep reading. And the irony about this, about this argument over creation, is that it's an attempt to know what simply can't be understood. It's often a prideful stance. But isn't that the very sin of Adam and Eve that we might be committing in our arrogance? Are we missing the very point of the story? Now, we keep reading, and we get to... The story of the first married couple. Did you know that this is what is said of them? Genesis 2.18, Then the Lord God said, It is not good for the man to be alone. I will make a helper who is just right for him. How many married couples would agree with that today? Don't answer, Gene. Do not answer. We get to the story of the fall. So here is the story most Christians know. You might know there's a tree with some fruit on it. God's like, yo, Adam, don't eat that. You can have all the other fruit. Just don't. Nope. Eve comes along, and most Christians will say, Christian men will say, it's her fault. 
The serpent deceives her, so she takes the fruit. Adam eats it too. No bueno. And they get expelled from the garden. I think I got it right. Here are some interesting points. It's not an apple. We don't know. <laughs> there are two trees. There is the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Then there's the tree of life. Kind of interesting. When they eat from the tree of knowledge, <laughs> first thing they realize is that they're naked. Kind of funny. So they get some fig leaves and cover themselves up. What else? Ignorance is bliss, I guess. But God replaced the fig leaves with animal skins. He made them, it says. Kind of interesting. So perhaps God initiates the first animal sacrifice before their son Abel. Kind of interesting. But before he expels them, he says, let's get rid of them out of the garden because they might eat from the tree of life and really become like us and live forever. Now, here's a funny point. <laughs> when they get caught, Adam knows he's wrong. God had already told him before Eve even got on the scene, don't eat from the fruit. And he knows. He knows he's wrong. But he doubles down. And if we're reading it right, it's kind of a little funny. <laughs> he blames Eve and God. <laughs> Genesis 3.12, the man replied, it was the woman you gave me. <laughs> who gave me the fruit, and I ate it. <laughs> Men have been doubling down from the very beginning. <laughs> the real issue here is pride. When he did it, when we do it, it was a lack of humility that caused them to think they could achieve equality with God. Serpent says this. Genesis 3.5 God knows that your eyes will be opened as soon as you eat it and that you will be like God, knowing both good and evil. They wanted to be God, so they tried to rob that equality from him. Do we do that today? Do we think we know everything or claim to know everything? Do some Christians do this? about the creation account. I know exactly how God created the whole universe. Okay. Do we need to listen to what God told Job regarding that? In what ways do we try to play God? It is the sin of pride, control, and lack of humility that leads us to attempt robbery from God. But now we have Christ. Romans 5, starting at verse 12. When Adam sinned, sin entered the world. Adam's sin brought death, so death spread to everyone, for everyone sinned. Yes, people sinned even before the law was given, but it was not counted as sin because there was not yet any law to break. Still, everyone died. From the time of Adam to the time of Moses, even those who did not disobey an explicit commandment of God as Adam did. Now, Adam is a symbol, a representation of Christ who was yet to come. But there is a great difference between Adam's sin and God's gracious gift. For the sin of this one man, Adam, brought death to many. But even greater is God's wonderful grace and his gift of forgiveness to many through this other man, Jesus Christ. And the result of God's gracious gift is very different from the result of that one man's sin. For Adam's sin led to condemnation, but God's free gift leads to our being made right with God, even though we are guilty of many sins. For the sin of this one man, Adam, caused death to rule over many. But even greater is God's wonderful grace and his gift of righteousness, for all who receive it will live in triumph over sin and death through this one man, Jesus Christ. 
Yes, Adam's one sin brings condemnation for everyone. But Christ's one act of righteousness brings a right relationship with God and new life for everyone. Because one person disobeyed God, many became sinners. But because one other person, Jesus, obeyed God, many will be made righteous. That is beautiful. And so is this. What you're looking at there is the Lord of the Rings edition of Scrabble. That's what that is. <laughs> <laughs> about like that. Last week we talked about the Greek. Well, reminder, the, the Bible of the early church was all in Greek, even the Old Testament. That surprises some people, but think about it. The New Testament is being written in Greek, so they're reading a Greek Old Testament. Go back and watch the Bible study last week's message for more info on that. What you're looking at there is Philippians 2, 5 through 11 in Greek. These are my favorite verses of Scripture. I don't have like a life verse. I kind of think that's a little silly. But anyway, we'll get to that on another day. <laughs> These are my favorite verses. I don't have just one. This is a gospel poem called the Carmen Christi in the early church. You got to have a pretty good Bible to figure some of this stuff out because a lot of times it will bracket it. It'll formulate these things so that you know it's kind of like a hymn or a poem. And that's what this is. Sometimes Paul will say things like, this is a trustworthy saying. That's a clue right there. So this tells us about the nature of Jesus Christ as God and what he did. Very, very important early biblical truths, probably sung in the early church. And it's not quite the same in Greek as it is in English. Remember the Christopher Columbus rhyme. We tried that out in Bible study. I had Alicia there who can speak both English and Spanish. And I said, translate this for me. In 1492, Christopher Columbus sailed the ocean blue. So she did it, and something was noted. Dos and azul don't rhyme. Right, like two and blue do. So what did she get right? <clears throat> she got the basic facts completely right. Totally right. That Christopher Columbus, in 1492, sailed the ocean blue. Yeah, she got that. It was the same in Spanish, the basic ideas. But it was missing the rhyme, kind of the point of why you do it. So you'll get the facts, but not the rhyme. Now, there are also rhymes and word plays in the Bible that get lost in translation. This is how it is in Greek sometimes. For example, a lot of people are surprised to find out that the Lord's Prayer we say all the time. It actually has a little rhyme and pattern to it. It's kind of cool. We get the facts right when we say it, and that's what's important. But you miss the poetry of it. That pattern in poetry and some of the beauty of Scripture gets lost in translation quite often. Same thing with John 1. It has a kind of pattern. It's poetry. It has a rhythm to it. I get it a little bit in English, but it gets lost. Gets the point across, but it's not the same. So I want to reassure you, don't expect you all to learn Greek. And that most widely accepted, generally accepted English Bible translations get the facts right. You're okay. You're getting the gospel facts. But like the 1492 thing, you're missing some of the beauty of Scripture. So I want to share that with you. The more Greek that I learn, the less snobbish and snooty I get about English translations. A lot of people are surprised. They're like, well, you know, some Greek? Why do you use an NLT on Sunday mornings, right? So we used to get snooty about that as early pastors before you learn Greek. Well, you learn things about translating, and you learn that you're forced at a certain point in even the most literal translations to paraphrase. And so I want to use a translation that everybody can understand, no matter what your reading level is. I want you to learn this stuff. So it's important to remember. So in this passage of Philippians, which I'm going to translate for you, the words have a very deep and rich meaning. And I want to share it with you. There's a connection here. You'll see where I'm going that isn't so obvious in English. But 
it is in Greek. So here what it's saying is, phroniti. So think like, make your own attitude, versions will say, like Christ Jesus, who, existing in the form of God, did not regard equality with God as something to be exploited or taken advantage of. We'll go back there. Instead, he emptied himself by assuming the form of a slave, taking on the likeness of man. And when he had come as a man in his external form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even to death on a cross. For this reason, God highly exalted him and gave him the name that is above every name so that at the name of Jesus, every knee would bend of those who are in heaven, on earth, and below the earth. And every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Now, the letter shapes are not the same as they are in English. So if you're trying to read along, you probably got a little lost. For example, a P is like an R sound, but this contains a lot of words that you probably actually understand. Words like anthropon, anthropology, man. That's the word for man. Let's see here, another one you might know. Thanato, like Thanos, from, just not even paying attention. Isn't that his name, right, from the Avengers thing, right? So that's death. What do you do? There you go. Glossa, tongues or languages. Uh, you wouldn't know. Renos, Kyrios, you wouldn't know. Lord. Doxa, doxology. Doxa, glory. Patros, father. The point. Obedience. Unlike Adam, who robbed from God, Jesus humbled himself in obedience, unlike Adam and Eve. You see the contrast here. There's more. So let's look at that first, Romans 5.19. Because one person disobeyed God, many became sinners. But because one other person, Jesus, obeyed God, many became righteous. Now, there's a word I want to cover that you probably don't know. If you say you do, I'm going to be really suspicious because it's a weird word. It appears in the Bible only once. I want to show you three English translations of how they deal with that word, arpagmon. It's interesting. I'll show you where it is. So, who, being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God. ESV, who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God as something to be grasped. So that's where, or a thing to be grasped, that's where arpagmon is. A thing to be grasped. Robbery. Philippians, though he was God, he did not think of equality with God as our pogmon, something to cling to. Now, it's plain to see that they're all different. None of these gets it completely wrong. Basic point is the same. But it would take all of them to get it completely right. It's probably best translated, the way I read it, like the NLT does, makes it easy to understand. But it's more than just a thing to cling to. Paul probably has something else in mind. A Greek friend of mine translated this as to snatch. Snatch. Hmm. Which is why the King James Version says robbery. The way someone might snatch fruit from a tree that didn't belong to them really a combination. And when you look at the Greek along with the full counsel of God's word, that is Philippians 2, Romans 5, Genesis 3, you get a richness, a depth in the text that paints a beautiful picture of a stunning reversal of the fall of man. A reversal of Adam and Eve's sin of snatching from God, to be like God. Jesus did not take advantage of his equality with God, like Adam and Eve tried to, took advantage, robbed from God, to become like God. Jesus became like us, so he could pay the price for our theft by placing himself on the tree. 
so that we can live forever. Amen. Amen. Adam lacked the humility of Christ. He lacked the obedience of Christ. He blamed God and Eve. He doubled down in his error. Unlike Christ, who displayed the ultimate humility and obedience. The black belt thing prepared me for what would happen to me in ministry later. I thought I knew a lot. And then I got smacked in the face with some realities. And this happens to a lot of pastors if they're paying attention. The reality was, as I spoke about last week, the Greek. There was more to it than I thought I knew. The Bible of the early church being quite different than the Protestant Bible I thought I knew everything from. There was the rest of the story. There was the fact that I was saying and teaching things that weren't quite right. I didn't really know the rest of the story. And I had a choice. I could double down, ignore it, or I could take the black belt off again and start from the beginning. Proverbs has taught me that humility leads to wisdom and insight. Pride leads to foolishness and destruction. Do we double down in our error? Or do we have the humility of Christ? Do we take the black belt off? Even if we have a lot invested in it. Could it be that we've invested in an education that wasn't so good as we thought it was? Or is just fueling our pride? Are we all about the titles? Or really serving one another? How can any of us even assign ourselves the title of Christian? If we're not acting like Christ, who was humble to the point of death. Pastors, I get it. The education, it cost you a lot of time and maybe some money. But are we willing to go beyond the scope of our schooling, which, if we're being honest, is restrictive? Are we going to double down on a denomination? Or are we going to humble ourselves with the humility of Christ? Husbands, how can we ask our wives to display humility if we ourselves are not humble? Remember, Christ washed feet. As a father, I've learned it's okay to say, I don't know. Your kids will actually respect you for it instead of fumbling with the technology. As a husband, I've learned to say, I'm sorry, I was wrong. Try it, it's good for your marriage. As a pastor, I've learned to say, I could be wrong, because sometimes I am, and I was. Which is why years ago, I started over again from the beginning. I took the time to really read and research so I could share with you the rest of the story.